Welcome back after the break. Um, just before we went for our break, we were looking at uh, Paul, you know, writing to the churches at uh, Galatia, Ephesus, and Corinth, and he's talking about, you know, how the works, okay, how they need to, what are the works that will disqualify them from inheriting or experiencing the kingdom of uh, God, okay? So, um, you know, we can say, uh, some of them have written here, Prabhu says, faith without deeds is dead, yes. And Nina John says, works follow uh, salvation. Works follow salvation, okay. Uh, I would say salvation follows works. So when we are saved, it shows in our works, okay. So, uh, Nina John, can you please close that door? Okay. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Nina Santos. I'm saying Nina John. <laughs> Nina John was you wondering. Okay. So, what is he saying? He's saying, telling believers, hey, I know, you know, you're saved by grace. We can ask the question, hey, Paul, when we are saved by grace through faith, then where does this works come? You know, how can you say we cannot inherit the kingdom of God? We can't even experience. Uh, because as believers, we've all saved by grace and we are all inherited the kingdom of God. So Paul will say, I know you're saved by grace, but I'm telling you, you cannot practice these things, okay? Because it's not part of kingdom living. And if you practice these things, you know, he's saying, you know, let me tell you that you will not inherit the kingdom of God, okay? So, um, so Paul is saying, you know, yes, you know, you're not saved by works. So I'm not saying you must do works to be saved or you need to keep the law to be saved, you know. But what I'm saying is, you know, you need to have a good works or holy life to show that you are saved. So Paul is saying you don't need good works to be saved and i know that you're saved by grace through faith but what he's saying is you must have good works or you are, need to live a holy life a righteous life to show that you are saved which means salvation and sanctification will go together that is why immediately after you are saved you've accepted jesus christ as a lord and savior you know you, uh, the Holy Spirit works in you to sanctify you. What is the meaning of sanctification? To set, set you apart, to cleanse you, to wash you, wash you uh, to make you like Jesus Christ. So salvation affects sanctification in the life of the individual. So Paul is very clear. He says those who practice these things, uh, and he's writing to the church, he said they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay. So we can say, what about the grace of God? Look at what Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 says. What does Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 say? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Therefore, since we are a single instrument, which cannot be shaken, it is healthy, by which we may serve God acceptably with the reverence and body of him. Okay, he says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. So Jesus is saying, this is the kingdom, which means this is the, the, the best kingdom is the eternal kingdom. And it's a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And so he's saying, let us have grace. Okay, so the literal meaning is let us appropriate or let us receive the grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear so it says because you've received a kingdom that cannot be shaken which is an eternal kingdom a kingdom that lasts forever he says you know let us have grace which means let us appropriate the grace that has been given to us let us receive the grace by which we may serve god acceptably with reverence and godly fear okay so we've been called here in with this kingdom. So let us appropriate that grace. And what will this grace do? Help us to live that godly life. It will lead you into reverence and godly fear, not in the other way. 
okay so what will the grace of god do grace of god does not just overlook your sin or cover your sin the grace of god will lead you into reverence and godly fear and not in the other way if you're talking about receiving a grace that you know um, liberates us into sinful indulgence or gratifying uh, or gratification of our sinful desires and being casual about sin that it's not the kind of grace that we are talking about it's not a grace that comes from god it's a grace that comes from satan to be gracious enough to live a sinful life and to to uh, into sinful indulgences and sinful gratification it's not the kind of grace that is given to those who are in the kingdom of god okay rather if you're using the grace of god to indulge in sin and say hey we have greater grace god is you know people say that right you know why are you so judgmental about little little things i'm doing you know god is so gracious he's merciful and loving he's forgiving he forgives my sin why are you judging say look at your own life people have you know told, told us that right when we point out there sin he's saying hey god is gracious why are you being like a uh, like a judge he's he's a loving god he's a forgiving god but you know when we're you misusing that grace you know that grace is not given to us from the kingdom of god it does not come from a god from god it is misunderstanding and it's misrepresentation of the true grace of god so we are misunderstanding misusing and misrepresenting the true grace of god because the grace of god will move us into a greater level of reverence to god and godly fear if you're not moving to a greater level of uh, level of reverence and godly fear then you're not talking about you know the grace of god okay so what about the grace it's the grace that helps you to develop kingdom lifestyle it's the grace of god that will move you further and deeper into walking the way god wants you and me to walk it's a grace that leads you to walk worthy of god who has called you into his own kingdom and his glory first thessalonians 2:12 can you read that please somebody first thessalonians chapter 2 verse 12 this grace leading of what we are also you in the divine kingdom of god yes the grace of god leads us to walk worthy of god who calls us into his own kingdom and glory okay another characteristic of kingdom living is righteousness peace and joy okay righteousness peace and joy look at romans chapter 14 verses 16 to 19 can somebody read that please Therefore, do not let your good uh, be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, pursue the things which make make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Amen. So she is saying the kingdom of God is not about biryani and chicken kebab and pasta and the pizza and burger and all of those uh, lovely things that we like to eat. But it's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Um, so he says those who serve Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. So he says therefore you know let us pursue. what makes peace and the things which edify one and other so basically righteousness peace and joy are things that you know make for peace and that edify one and other okay so in romans chapter 14 paul is basically addressing the subject of what you should eat and what you should not eat and in that context paul makes several things or several statements and then finally he sums it up uh this way he says you know listen at the end of the day the kingdom of god is not about what you eat and drink it's about righteousness which means right standing with god it's right living before man it's peace and joy that comes from the holy spirit okay and he says if you pursue these things you are accepted by god 
and you will get the approval of man. So what's the point here? Okay, the point is this: that as as a kingdom person, you and I must understand that we are called to pursue the higher things of righteousness, peace, and joy. And if need be, we sometimes even sacrifice our own legitimate rights to what we should eat, what we should drink, uh, in order to pursue what promotes righteousness, peace, and joy. So in this context, Paul is basically saying, if I eat something that causes my brother to stumble, I won't eat it. Why? Because for me, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit is more important than what I eat and drink. And he says, that is the kingdom of God. So what is he saying? You know, we may have some legitimate rights, what we can eat, uh, the way we can live, what we can do, what we cannot do. You know, you have some legitimate rights, some things that you can, you have the rights to. But if you're pursuing the kingdom of God, okay, you will pro pursue what promotes righteousness, peace, and joy, so that that will edify people around you and will extend the kingdom of God. Okay, so this is how we need to look at uh, and live as kingdom people, okay, or kingdom citizens. Now, this uh, just think about this issue. You know, we have a problem mostly with young people. Now, nowadays we see our young people. You know. Um, they just uh, put their arms, you know, boys or, or even nowadays girls put their arms around guys. You just meet anyone in college or you meet anyone in church or you meet anyone on the street and boys and girls are just hugging each other, you know. So if we tell them, you know, don't do that, that's not like our culture. That's not what when people look at us, especially in the church context. If you do it, you know, what would, uh, you know, other believers think? They all, always think that we Christians are very free in the way that we live and eat in the in our lifestyle you know so when we tell young people this some of them you know I'm sorry for being very crude but they say hey i'm not making her pregnant you know that's that's their response uh you know what they're basically saying is hey it's harmless you know uh, but as a kingdom person you're going to pursue something that is higher something that is greater, you're pursuing righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, so that you can edify people, so that you can promote the kingdom of God. And you're willing to sacrifice these legitimate things of what you can eat, drink, what you think you should be able to do, what you think the world is doing. I know your young people say, in my college, it's the culture. You know, in my college, everyone does this. You know, but I don't see the point why we need to keep hugging everybody that we go meeting around you know uh, or why do we okay just put your arm around but why you know, sometimes it's it's not even the the way that is done is not it's not right so you know you say hey everyone does it you know but we are different we are pursuing the kingdom of god and because you're a kingdom person person you know you'll do what you have to do to get god's approval and the blessed approval of man because that is the kingdom of God. So kingdom of God is not just getting approval of God, but also of man. So when people look at us, you know, they should not think otherwise. Hey, this person is going around hugging everybody. They're kissing everybody. They're just you know, putting their arms. It doesn't give a right, uh, you know, uh, thought about you when, when people look at you because it's not our uh, culture. Okay. So we need to pursue what, you know, gets God's approval and also the approval of man okay that's the kingdom of god another characteristic of the kingdom of god is power authority and dominion now we'll talk about this in detail in another chapter but just like to mention here that the kingdom that is in us is a kingdom that is of power and authority and it's a kingdom that supersedes everything that is around us a kingdom that overpowers everything around us so the king of the kingdom he is in us and he has given us the keys of authority and as believers he has the west he has vested power in each one of us so wherever we go the kingdom of god goes with us and wherever we go we carry his kingdom power and we carry his kingdom authority and we carry his kingdom dominion which means the kingdom of god is there so 
for example, when you step into an unpleasant, bad or a difficult situation, what do you need to know? The king is there with you in that, in your midst, okay? The king is there uh, inside you. You know, the, the kingdom of God is there with you. And you also have the potential and the power to dominate that situation okay you have the potential and the power and the authority to speak against that situation to speak against those circumstances you know and you will not allow the circumstances uh, to rule you and to dictate you but you will live and allow the kingdom of god that is inside you to come out and administer the authority of the kingdom and you know you will when you do that you will experience your situation change, you will experience power, you will experience, uh, you know, um, the authority to dominate the situation, to speak into the situation, and you will see your situation change, okay? So this is, uh, this kingdom is a kingdom of power and authority and dominion. Uh, look at what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. Can somebody read that, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. 20. But I will come to you shortly, the Lord knows, and I will know, not the words of those who help that but the power. The kingdom of God is not in the world, but in the power. Yes, so here he says, the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Okay, so Paul says, when I come among you, I don't want to I don't want to know about words, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. So what is he saying? He's saying that this kingdom that I'm talking about is not a kingdom of nice words that I can talk about. It's a kingdom that comes with power to destroy the works of the devil, to dominate the works of darkness, to undo sickness and disease. And he says that is the kind of kingdom that I'm talking about. Okay, it's a kingdom that comes with power and just totally removes what darkness is doing. And he says, This is the kind of kingdom that I'm talking about. Okay, even when Jesus was among his people, he said, You know, what does he say? You know, if I do things by the spirit of God, you know, if I'm casting out devils, how do I know? How do you know that I'm doing things by the spirit of God? Because when I cast out, demons when I cast out devils and you know when I do it by the power of the spirit of God that the kingdom of God has come amongst you or the kingdom has, of God has come to you so this kingdom when it comes it drives out devils okay when Jesus sent his disciples and he asked them to go and preach saying the kingdom of God is at hand and what should you do the kingdom of God is at hand heal the sick Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and cast out demons. Okay, so he says, when you go preaching about the kingdom of God and saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it should show by your power and it should show by your authority. How? It should show by demonstrations of healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, raising the dead, and casting out demons. Okay, so that is the kind of kingdom that we are talking about about and this should be part of our lifestyle that when we go out we are carrying the kingdom of god with us okay i was just reminded of a little incident which i uh, you know listened to um this one of the churches that i really admire it's a very uh, powerful church and um you know um uh, in this church the pastor was saying that you know in, in one of his sermons uh, he was saying that, um, you know, there was a, a, a believer who just came visiting the church. And after church service, he met this pastor of this church. And he said, you know, I want to be part of your uh, the team that goes for mall outreach. Okay. So the pastor looked at him very puzzled. He said, uh, sorry, we don't have a mall outreach. So this uh, person said, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the people who go to the malls, and I've heard that, you know, they heal the sick, they have, uh, uh, you know, they've spoken words of comfort, encouragement, they've spoken destiny to people's life, and, um, you know, they have uh, even healed people on uh, wheelchairs and all of those things. So I want to be part of that 
uh, the, that ministry. So, you know, the pastor looked at him and smiled and he said, you know, um, uh, you know, um, we don't have a ministry that, you know, is in shopping malls, but he says that whenever our members go shopping, they just sense the need, they just step in and they just minister, you know. So this, this church is really so powerful that like even when they're having conferences, even people at the registration desks, you know, even before people come in and experience the power of God in worship and ministry time, leave alone all of that, they just come to the registration desk and they are ministered to. You know, they receive word of uh, healing or, uh, sorry, word of deliverance or healing or, uh, you know, um, word of uh, knowledge, word of wisdom, prophecy, just at the uh, registration um, desk. So he says, you know, when, when our members go shopping, they just see their need, they step in, uh, they heal, they get people saved, they get people delivered. And, uh, you know, so that is the kind of church that this church is, uh, you know, and, and they, they want to see heaven here on earth. That is their whole agenda. That is their whole purpose. Okay. So, you know, uh, the likewise, we too, you know, wherever we go, we carry the kingdom of God in us. And we need to be aware that the kingdom of God is in us. And wherever we go, the God wants to release his kingdom, power, authority, and dominion in and through us. Okay. Amen. Amen. Okay. Another aspect of kingdom lifestyle is endurance and suffering. Okay. So please follow in your books. I think some of you are already going out to sleep. Um, it's Monday morning. But I think it's a Sunday blues. Okay. Endurance and suffering. Shai, you didn't get another cup of tea for yourself? Don't worry. Don't be disappointed. It fell down. It's okay. You can go and get another cup of chai later on. Okay. Another aspect of kingdom lifestyle is endurance and suffering. Okay. Now, um, you know, we've just come to this understanding that, you know, we are all ambassadors of Christ, Jesus Christ. Meaning what? what who's an ambassador? Representative. Yeah, a representative. Somebody who represents their country in another country. Okay. So meaning we are told we are totally from a different country, can a totally different culture, a different kingdom. environment, a different kingdom. We belong to the kingdom that's not of this world. And we are here in foreign territory, so to speak. Okay. And therefore we will feel pressure, right? We will be accused, we will face persecution, but we need to endure those things here on earth. It's part of kingdom living. Okay. Now, sometimes we get this wrong idea that if we belong to the kingdom of God and we are the king's kid, okay, or the king's son and daughter, KK, king's kid, okay. <laughs> it's true that we are the king's kid, but we tend to, you know, imply that everything is going to be easy for us. Just like a king, you know, king's kid is, you know, the prince or the princess, everything is very easy. Everything is made available, available for uh, so we think everything is going to be very easy. Did, did God promise everything is going to be easy for his king's kids? No. Okay. Uh, did he say, you know, um, uh, everything is going to be easy? No. He said, hey, you are my kids. Yes. But he didn't say that you're not going to suffer. He didn't say you're not going to go to persecutions. He didn't say you're going, not going to face any problems or difficulties. And he didn't say that you don't need endurance. Okay, he didn't say that he won't be persecuted. Yes, as a king's kid, you know, we are in foreign territory right now. And we are here on this earth. And we need endurance. We need perseverance. We need grace. We need strength to go through some adverse, difficult situations, some circumstances. Um, sometimes, you know, we create it for ourselves. Sometimes we don't create. Other people create around us, create it for us. And we're like, God, you know, why is this happening? Or why am I in this? I didn't do anything. But part of kingdom lifestyle is endurance, is willingness to go through suffering, is willingness to go through some hard times. That is kingdom lifestyle. Amen? Okay. Look at one verse in Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Can somebody read that, please? Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God. For 
for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also which you also support. Amen. So Paul is saying, you know, he's telling the church at the Thessalonica that you know, here I've heard. Now you're going through some real difficult situations. You're going through some hard times. But he's saying, hey, I want to let you know this. You know, look at it this way. You know, he's saying, this is an evidence that you've actually been called into the kingdom of God. You know, they might be looking for some kind of help from Paul. But what is Paul saying? Hey, I want to let you know that this is just an evidence that even as you're going through all this problem and suffering, that you are called to be part of the kingdom of God. That is what it is. Okay. It's an evidence that you are now part of the kingdom of God. And therefore, you are facing all of these problems. So go through it. You know, so that even your faith that is tested like fire is going to come out like gold. Okay. So what happens? Why when God takes us through all these persecutions, difficulties, what happens to our faith? Our faith is not going to become wavered. It's not going to become weary. It's not going to be dull, but it's going to become stronger because it's tested by fire. It's going to come out as gold. Okay. So part of kingdom lifestyle is endurance and suffering. Another characteristic of kingdom lifestyle, Sean, is forgiveness. Okay, forgiveness is another important aspect of kingdom living. Okay, now Jesus told many stories, and every time he began some stories, how did he begin? A parable. And how did he begin the parable? The kingdom of God is like this. Ah, the kingdom of God is like this, or the kingdom of heaven is like this. Okay. So he's basically saying that the story reveals something about the kingdom of God. Okay. So let us look at um, one of the kingdom parables about extending forgiveness in Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 to 35. So can somebody read that, please? Give it to Sean. Let him read. It's almost falling asleep. <laughs> I can wake up. Thank you, Sean. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wants to settle accounts with his servants. And we had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Then he was not able to uh, pay. His master commanded that he be spoke with his wife and children and all that he had, and that the payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him and forgave the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred and a hundred and And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe, pay me what you owe me. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison. That he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgive you all the debt because I uh, forgive you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his uh, master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that he was uh, due to him. So my heavenly father also will do to you uh, if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Amen. So here we see in this parable, you know, um, servant of a master owes him just say thousand rupees. Okay. So he finds out that he's not paid him back and he says get him, sell everything that he has, including his wife and children, and let him pay back the debt. And what does this servant say? He begged him for mercy and, you know, for grace. And what does his uh, master do? He just forg forgives him, writes off his debt. So he's very excited. He's very happy. You know, the thousand rupees, just imagine he's running home to tell his wife. 
And on the way, he sees somebody running away from him and hiding. And he notices that is one of his servants who owed him just say 100 or 20 rupees. What does he do? He runs behind him, catches him by the collar, maybe gives him a nice shake and tells him, where is my money? You haven't paid it back. So he says, you know, I'm very poor. I don't have, give me some more. Time he begs and he pleads. But does he forgive him? No. What does he do? Yeah, he puts him into prison. Now the master servants are uh, standing on the road and watching all this tamasha that is happening, all this drama that is happening, and they go tell the master. You know, and what does the master do? He's very, very angry. And what does he do? Sorry. Yes, he's so angry with him, he delivers him to be tortured until he should pay all that is due that he had to pay. Okay, so what is Jesus basically saying through this parable? Sorry, okay, God has shown you forgiveness, so you forgive others, God has shown you mercy, you show mercy to others. Okay, what else? Do to others as you would like them to do to you. Jesus is basically saying that, you know, you're going to be condemned. You're going to be judged. Okay. This is how the kingdom of God is. This is the how the principle of the kingdom. What is the principle of the kingdom? Okay. As much as you have been forgiven by God, God expects you to forgive those who offend you. Okay. God expects us to extend his mercy and forgiveness to those who have wronged us in the same manner in which he has extended his mercy and grace into our lives. Okay, so extended, extended forgiveness should be unconditional and should be freely given and that is kingdom lifestyle. Yes, Sean? What was the time that we used to tell you? Yes, what standards we use to judge others and forgive us, forgive others, the same standards will be used against us. Now, forgiveness does not alter, sorry, yes, can you take that mic? Forgiveness does not alter the thing that has happened, okay? It, uh, it does not change the thing that has happened, but forgiveness releases us from having any kind of bitterness, anything kind of hatred and anger that we can hold against that. Person. What has happened has happened. We can't reverse those things that have been said, that has been done. There's nothing that you can do to reverse it, but you can do things that uh, there's something that you can do not to hold the bitterness and hatred uh, in your heart against that person. And that is forgiveness. And forgiveness, Jesus said, is part of kingdom, living kingdom culture. Yes, Prince. Oh. And uh, so, like, uh, you know, God forgives us, but we should not continue to do something wrong. So, like, my question is, like, what if the other people who continue to uh, making wrong again and again? Mm -hmm. So, what our response is, like, we have to do every time? What does Jesus say? <laughs> forgive 70 times seven what does it mean you can't count the number of times right and what does the word of god say he says as far whatever you can do pursue peace okay and you know he's, it says be patient you know be long suffering what is long suffering long suffering is a person is doing it again and again and again to you but you are just patient, you are long suffering, you're gentle. It does not mean that you just take every thing that the person is doing. Like, suppose somebody's abusing you, you know, physically or sexually, you can't just keep on saying it, I keep forgiving and let the person do it. Or, you know, somebody's cheating you. You can't say, hey, God says, forgive you, continue cheating me. You know, you, it's not that you do. You take that step. You need, wherever you need to take action, you take the necessary action you step out you protect yourself you do something you know you get help you go away from that person uh you know make sure that the person is not continuing to cheat you stop all of those things but what is saying it's saying forgive forgiveness in your heart don't hold anything bitter or anything against that person and don't repay that person evil for 
actual the manner as we have told like uh, if they were doing something wrong for like there is something we have to forgive, but something we have to take this step and uh, draw those lines and keep them alive. Like, yes, you have to take the steps so and even God does the same, like even if we are continue to you know uh, doing something breaks his heart, even God says like, okay, enough is enough. I'm gonna keep you, I forgive you, but stay a distance from me, or else I keep my myself away from you because you can't can't stand the cutting in your brain. Is that the same place to what does the Bible say? <laughs> One minute, what does the Bible say? Does God keep us away? No. No. Does God keep us away? He grieves his heart, it quenches his heart. You know, the Holy Spirit, you know, um, I mean, he stays away from us. I mean, you know, he stays away in the sense he's there in us. He keeps prompting us. But when we don't listen, what does the word of God say? God gives us into our sin. He allows us to do what we, because he's given us a free will to choose, right? So, uh, but our conscience and the Holy Spirit, you know, the conscience that, that Paul says in Romans chapter 3, he says, is, and chapter 2 is a written law that is in our hearts. For those who want to have the law, the Jews have the law, the Gentiles don't have, he says there's a conscience, a written conscience of the law, a, a written conscience in your heart, he says, or the written law in your heart, and he says that is conscience, okay? So your conscience tricks you, but God is not going to keep you away from him. He loves you, but his sin hurts you. It hurts him, yes. So it's like God won't uh, keep us away, but we will be going back to where we are. Yes, the more we go away, the more we are indulging in sin, we open the door to the devil. And, you know, the devil is all out to steal, kill and destroy our life. Yes, he leaves us to our free will each time. But then when we, we go back, he's, he accepts us and he receives us as a father. The best example of this is the prodigal son. The prodigal son went away, but what did the father do? What did he do? What did the father do every time when the, the son went away? What did the father do? He sat, he waited for his son to return. In the story, he went only once. He went only once, but then we, it does not it does not mention, but it implies that he was living a wayward life from a long time. He made a decision where to step out of home. Yes, that was his last resort where he stepped out. But in spite of him being lazy and not going and doing his work and not honoring the father, the father still kept him at home, did not throw him, still loved him. Even when he said, give me my inheritance, the father tried to stop him and he did not. See, so the prodigal son is a very, very good uh, parable to understand God's love and the way he works with us. Because that sin is when the sin is there between us and God. It keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and this gap that makes it a huge gap between us and God. Yes, sin takes us away from God. But even you see in the old testament, the Israelites sin against God. But what what was God doing? He was like a mad lover just wooing them back. You say, come back to me, come back to me, come back. I will, you know, I will restore you. I will repay back. I will do everything. I will bless you. So he, it, it just showed like a, a, like a lover just going behind, son, like, a, like a husband going behind an adulterous uh, wife because they were committing spiritual adultery, right? So we see how he keeps going behind them, moving them back to him, himself. Just look at, read the Old Testament. The Old Testament is just about how God is like a mad, passionate lover, just wooing back his people to himself. Okay. Even when he says, I will punish you, sends them to exile, he says, you know, return back to me and I will love you. You know, I will flourish you. You will be like a great nation. I will bless you. That is the God that we have. Yes. Does that help, Prince? Okay. Another important characteristic is stewardship. Okay. 
So Jesus gives us another story in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 uh, to verse 30. Can somebody read that, please? So the children of heaven is like a man traveling for a far country who called his own servant and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each one according to his own ability. And immediately they went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. Likewise, and likewise, he who had received two gained two or four also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his lost money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, he delivered me to uh, five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. The Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, uh, he also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, he delivered to me two talents. Look, I have given two more talents beside them. The Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you uh, had to, you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid, and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But the Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew I, I, that I reap where I have not sown. Uh, and the other word, I have not scattered seed. You ought to have been deposited my money with the bankers that at that coming I would have received back, uh, received back with my own interest. So take the talent away uh, from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has more, whoever has more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Amen. Thank you. So Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is, you know, like this. You know, the, the kingdom in the kingdom of heaven, I expect people to be good stewards of what I have given them. Okay. So it's not important how much he's given us, how many things he's given us. What is important is. What do you do with what he has given you? It's not important how much you receive, five, two, or one, but it's important about what you do with what he has given you. Some of you may have little, some of you have may have little more, some of you have may have a lot, whole lot more, but he's not going to ask you how much I gave you. He's going to ask you, what did you do with what I have given you? Did you? Double it? Did you multiply it? Were you a good steward of what I have given you? That means, are you a good steward of the time you know I've given you? Are you a good steward of the opportunities that I've given you? Are you a good steward of the contacts, the talents, the abilities, the revelation from his word that he's given you, the opportunities that you are here to learn? There's a whole lot of things that he has given us. You know, but he's expecting us to be a good steward. So God is asking you today, you know, as students in the Bible college, are you a good student of the time and the opportunity that you're using the time and opportunity to study his word? So you're here not to do anything else, but you're here to study his word, study the truths in his word, the revelation, and you're being taught so much. God is saying, are you using your time profitably to study this, this this time to study, to prepare yourself so that I can take you into and launch you into ministry. So are we, how are we using the money that he's given us, the opportunities that he's given us all? For some, those of you who are online e-learning students, you know, you're a businessman, businesswoman, you're working, secular field, you know, whoever you are, you know, how are you using the opportunities, time, money, the talents, the contacts, the abilities, and the revelation from God's word that he's given us. And he's saying, no, we need to be good stewards. That is part of kingdom lifestyle. You know, 
Um, so, um, you know, if you're not using it, then we are accountable to God. Okay. Another characteristic of kingdom lifestyle is no partiality. Uh, we read in James chapter 2, um, can somebody read that please? James chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if they should come in the uh, your assembly, or that of gold rings, in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing fine clothes, and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, You stand there, or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Okay, amen. So here Jesus is saying in the kingdom of God, we need to treat everybody equally or the same. So whether they are rich, poor, whether they are educated, uneducated, whether they have a high standing in society or, you know, they're just some person, just some ordinary person, regardless of their caste, regardless of their, you know, um, their uh, culture, their language. You know, we need to treat everyone equally. Why? We are all children of God. They're all the heirs of his kingdom. Okay. Um, and we do nothing out of partiality and that is kingdom lifestyle so let us live like that you know let us reach out to the poor to the let us reach out to those who are rich those who are educated uneducated uh, people of all ages we need to reach them out for the kingdom of god okay and the word of god says you know that we need to give honor to whom honor is due okay the word of god says we hold in high regard those who um you know, who, um, sorry, we hold in high regard those who serve the Lord and those who labor in the word, okay, and those who give spiritual oversight, like we read in First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. But yet, in the way we do things, we should not show partiality or we should not provide preferential treatment based on earthly criteria like wealth, like social standing, like even gender differences, you know, reading this in First Peter chapter 3, verse 7, but treat everyone equally and give everyone the honor that is due to them. Okay, we'll stop here. We just have two more points in this chapter and we we'll look at it um, next week. Anyone has any questions? When so fast? Yes, time flies. Okay, anyone has any questions? Online students, anyone has any questions? Anyone has any questions? Okay, there are no questions. Um, okay, thank you, Anthony. <laughs> any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll end class. Thank you everyone for joining class. And have a blessed week ahead. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you.